But I wanted to go over uh, a few things uh, that he said in his interview with me on Monday yeah. about Israel that um, I tried to push back on, but you're more equipped to do so. So let me just, I'll just play some of this and you can, uh, you can comment on it. I'm against the judicial reform. Israel has the, has the probably, well, I, not probably, but Israel has the best judiciary in the world. It is better than ours. It is more, um, more humane. Um, it is the only better than ours. There's no constitution in, in Israel. Okay. Oh, say go ahead. So what you want? Israel you want to... has no constitution, but it does have a series of of basic laws, and one of those laws defines Israel as a, as a Jewish state, uh, which would be sort of like the Supreme Court defining the U.S. as a white Christian nation. Uh, but let's go on. And and you know, if, if, I don't know if there's any way to speed up his comments, but we could get through a lot more if it was like 1.5 speed. Unfortunately. Uh, that All right. outright forbids torture even in the ticking time bomb, bomb scenario. It's the only judiciary that's actually uh, specifically addressed the ticking bomb scenario. So you have a, a terrorist who you've caught, who you know knows there's a bomb that's going to kill tens of thousands of civilians. And you and the, the Israel judiciary has said, even in that case, you cannot torture him. No other judiciary in the world says that. The Israel judiciary has, you know, there's so, they, so the so, ticking time bomb scenario, Israel has uh, introduced and perfected the doctrine of of uh, you know preemptive military strikes, where if they think they simply drop two thousand pound bombs on anyone they determine to be a militant in the Gaza Strip during military escalations, entire families have been killed, uh, bombed in their homes simply because they belong to Hamas. This is why you see the destruction of so many homes in the Gaza Strip. And then, of course, Israel has practiced uh, torture throughout its history. The first intifada, there was the broken bones policy where Yitzhak Rabin actually instructed his soldiers to break the bones of Palestinians who threw stones. There was the helicopter technique perfected by uh, the Israeli Shin Bet in, in detention. Uh, Torture is used through uh, isolation, psychological torture. I mean, it's still practiced by Israel, so I don't know what, he, what he's talking about there. Okay. I think three of the 12 um, uh, Supreme Court justices are Palestinians. Um, there are Palestinian judges all over, as there are legislatures, and uh, and it's guaranteed you know, full participation of Palestinians in the electoral process. There's 1.9 million Palestinians in Israel who vote there in elected legislatures okay so, can we stop yes there? i'll stop there go ahead so he's saying palestinians have full equal rights inside the state of israel first of all i as a jew have more rights than any palestinian citizen of the state of israel because of the jewish uh the law of return which allows me just simply because uh i have a matrilineal jewish line i can declare myself an israeli citizen and therefore uh, I have two countries, even though I have no connection to Israel whatsoever, except that I visited there. There are 100,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel who are internally displaced because of the absentee property law, which seized their property in 1948 and gave it to Jews. The uh, Israeli Lands Administration or Israeli Lands Law hands land to the Jewish National Fund, which exclusively gives land to Jews, which makes it virtually impossible for Palestinians to own land. Then there's the Citizenship and Entry Law, which prevents Palestinian citizens of Israel from marrying Palestinians from the West Bank or Gaza. Why? Because the state of Israel as a Jewish state is afraid that they'll have too many babies and that they won't be Jewish babies, and Israel needs to define itself as a Jewish state according to its so-called Jewish demographic majority. That's why it practices ethnic cleansing, like the kind I witnessed in the Negev of Palestinian citizens who are Bedouin. Their village of Al Arakib has been demolished over seventy times because it's called an auth because it's defined as an unauthorized construction. The Bedouin there are not allowed to build except in these reservation style towns because once again, the land is for the Jews. Uh, that, but, but let's go back to the citizenship law. It limits who Palestinian citizens of Israel can marry. Imagine an American law that limited who Americans could marry according to nationality because of demographics. Uh, that's not a democracy. So let's we can move on. Okay. You're represented in the judiciary. 
and they can practice freedom of religion. It's the only place in the Middle East where you can, they guarantee protection for gays. There was a, um, uh, a pride parade uh, two weeks ago in Israel with 150,000 people in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and in Jerusalem. At the same time, in a- now to, you know when when he was saying that in my head, I was thinking that's I was thinking like this is the equivalent of Andrew Jackson, you know, um, doing the Trail of Tears and then doing a gay parade at the same time, right? And he said that I mean that's how what I was thinking. exactly. Yeah, it's like if he had the gayest Trail of Tears ever. Uh, I mean, and these are gay soldiers who. Uh, car- uh, carry out drone strikes against Palestinians who enforce the occupation. Uh, but they, you know, th- so what he's doing there is pink washing. He's justifying yes. occupation and apartheid on the basis of a gay parade in Tel Aviv, which, by the way, a, at least a plurality of Jewish Israelis consider satanic. And gay parades have been attacked in Jerusalem. Uh, but the point is, he's he's he's, he's doing pink washing. I, I hadn't heard that term before, but that's what that is. That's that. It's sick uh, it, because okay. it's basically saying if you have a gay parade, you can treat uh, the indigenous, backwards, retrograde natives as, as, as bomb them to rubble and, and treat them like fifth class citizens. And that and that's the thing, right? Like I've covered so many stories on Israel. And Palestine, where Israel just wipes out neighborhoods. This idea, I've seen the video, I saw it. And this is what we had the falling out with Dave Rubin over, right? I mean, political falling out with Dave Rubin. I didn't have a personal falling out with him. We had a political falling out because he was for them bombing schools. Yeah. And he was like that. I'm like, they're, bo- they're literally bombing schools. I'm covering this. I know this is happening. <clears throat> And, you know, I saw, I remember on even Meet the Press when David Gregory used to host it, there was that guy literally crying because they were bombing schools and they wouldn't stop. They were calling the military leaders, please, please don't bomb this school. Please, and then they did it anyway. Yeah, they kept bombing these UN schools that were used to house people in the Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places on earth. And in 2014, when Israel was bombing the... Uh, areas along the buffer zone, which are heavily populated to ruins with 155 pound US supplied howitzers with 2000 pound, 500 pound bombs. I went to these areas and just found shrapnel everywhere among the destroyed homes. People had to evacuate. So they went to UN schools and then the UN schools were getting bombed That's left right. and right. And there were casualties. But I mean, and, uh, Bobby goes on to say that Israel only uh, attacks military targets. That's not what Israel says. That's not what the general staff of Israel's military high command says. Uh, the former chief of staff of the Israeli military, Gadi Eisenkot, conceived a doctrine called the Dahia Doctrine. It's named after a southern Beirut majority Shia neighborhood that Israel destroyed, leveled to the ground in 2006 in its failed war in Le- uh, against Lebanon and specifically against Hezbollah. And the point of this doctrine is that you don't attack the military targets, you attack the popular base of the political force that you aim to destroy in hopes of demoralizing that population so that they will turn against their leadership. It's sort of like uh, sanctions, but with bombs. And that's why Israel, you see Israel destroying during military escalations entire neighborhoods. It's according to that doctrine, the Israeli military, if you're watching this now, just Google mowing the lawn Israel or mowing the lawn Gaza. Israeli military commanders call it mowing the lawn, something they have to do every few years against the population of Gaza or southern Lebanon, cutting the grass down to size it, so that they don't grow up and resist Israel. Okay. And they were hanging gays from cherry pickers. So he's doing the, Wait a minute. Uh, I mean, is he only, he's doing the in Iran at the same time in Iran as they were having gay it's pride like every, parades in Israel. They were hanging them in Iran. Go ahead. I mean, it's like every few seconds we have to stop it. I know correct? it's not good. Okay, not to say Iran is some like progressive LGBTQ IAA two SS plus paradise. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that, but he's saying at the same time Iran was hanging gays, like masses of gays from cherry pickers. Maybe I missed the news, but <laughs> this seems kind of like a exaggeration. Uh. 
again, the reason why there's a <clears throat> there's a theocratic government in Iran is because the same CIA that killed his father and his uncle overthrew their gov- democratically elected government so we could steal their oil. And he knows that. <laughs> and that's why the people of Iran have to live with that government. That's why. Okay. Place where women have full rights. It's the you know it's the only place where Palestinians can legally complain about their government with no fear of reprisals. Oh, anywhere else that Pal- including the Palace, including the West Bank. You know, if you complain about the whoa, extremely whoa, whoa. corrupt uh, governments in the West Bank or Gaza, you you know you. So when he says that there's extremely corrupt governments in Gaza, that's like saying that the the prison gang is corrupt because Gaza is a prison and you can't let you, you can't not let people travel. You can't refuse people the right of travel. And that that makes that a, a prison. And then you can't bomb a prison no matter how bad the people in the prison are. You can't yeah. bomb a prison. OK, and, which I said that, yes. but. Uh, it you know he he talked over me when I was saying that but so now go ahead well, what would you like to say Max well exactly I mean he's using uh, the repression such it is as it is of the Hamas authorities in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority which is funded by the United States in the West Bank to justify occupation while denying that the occupation even exists, exists. but right now as we speak there are protests in the Gaza Strip yeah. uh, people are demanding better services from the Hamas ruling government they're not being shot and killed in the streets there not everyone dies if they protest or criticize their government however they are repressive governments and they're repressive by design particularly the palestinian authority which was designed by the united states according to the oslo accords and is funded to be repressive so that it arrests palestinians and prevents them from resisting their occupier their dispossessor so he's and then and then if you as a Palestinian attempt to resist the occupation in the West Bank, you will be shot by Israel. I've seen it in villages like Nabi Saleh, in villages like Belin or Nalin, which are small farming villages that exist uh, along the line of the apartheid wall. These farmers and families who've been cut off from their own land by a wall went out and protested the military without weapons, and they were shot by st- rubber-coated steel bullets tear gas, uh, skunk water. I've watched their homes sprayed with this toxic skunk water. And some of them have been killed with live fire. And at night, the Israeli military would come in and arrest them in their beds, including arresting small children in their beds of these villages. So the Israel is the ultimate repressive force. And it controls, it essentially controls what happens with the Palestinian Authority. The reason people voted for Hamas in the first place was because they were willing to resist and they were seen as less corrupt than the Palestinian Authority. Okay. Risk your life and you risk, and you'll face torture and death. So, um, you know the the, the the judiciary in Israel is unique in the world. Um, it's also said you can't pressure people using putting pressure on their family. You can't pressure terrorists in that way at all. Um, it, uh, it, I have a feeling that happens all the time, though. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, again, well, I'm may, not an expert. You can go to jail for it, but I'm not. You're right, but I'm not a. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert. And you can sue people. For right. it. Okay. <clears throat> so, wh- Max, was I correct that that they, they pressure people? That what he said that doesn't happen happens all the time. Was I correct or wrong? What was he saying doesn't happen? That you, that the judiciary in Israel says you can't pressure people. You can't like. Um, pressure the families of terrorists and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. If you're deemed a quote unquote terrorist, which means if you engage in uh, armed activity in the West Bank against, for example, the Israeli military or settlers, Israel will demolish your family's home. They do it again and again. They blow up homes. They do it in East occupied East Jerusalem and Silwan as well. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> Israel doesn't deny that they do that. It's textbook collective punishment um and then they also destroy uh communities and families by recruiting collaborators using uh you know 
trying to so blackmail that, them and pressure them in, in order to collaborate with the Israeli authorities. If they find out, for example, that they're, you know, that, so that, that would be gay. like, so that would be like if somebody committed a terrorist act, like, like Timothy McVeigh, let's just say the worst terrorist in American history. And that would be like, if we went to his house and then crushed his house where his parents and brothers and sisters lived, that's what they do in yeah. Israel. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, and this isn't this isn't people who've been blowing up federal. No, buildings. I know. I'm just, but I'm that's why I'm using an ex gross yes. example. We wouldn't even do that in the United States. We wouldn't go to Timothy McVeigh's house and crush it with his family inside of it because he did something so terrific. But you're saying they do that all the time, and is that's their policy, actually? Yeah, there's another film I would recommend to Robert Kennedy Jr. called Arna's Children. It's about a woman named Arna Meyer who's a Jewish woman who had a mixed Jewish Palestinian son. She died of cancer after starting a theater in Janine, an occupied Palestinian city with a refugee camp filled with people who have been dispossessed by Israel. And she started a theater for the youth there. And her son, Giuliano, took over that theater after she died of cancer. And during the second intifada, the theater was destroyed by Israeli bulldozers along with much of the refugee camp. And the youth, many of the youth who are in the theater programs, and the theater is still active, by the way, uh, they participated in armed activity. They battled Israeli soldiers in the streets of Janin. And it profiles some of these youth, and they explain why they picked up the gun. And many of them had already had their homes demolished by Israel. That's why they did it. Imagine just having your family home destroyed by a foreign occupying army. How would you feel? Right. I know. Okay, let's see what else. Mm. Every year now we give two point three billion to Egypt, which, you know, has no human rights, and we give a billion to Jordan, which has no human rights. And we mm. give eight hundred million a year to the Palestinian Authority, which uses that money to pay bounties two Palestinians who killed Jews, not government officials. Now, that, tell me, that doesn't, that doesn't happen for 15 years, right? Well, it's just a straight up lie in the first place. The Palestinian Authority coordinates directly with the Israeli military. Do you think the Israeli military would coordinate with them or Congress would fund them if that was happening? And he goes on to say it's any Jew anywhere in the world. I mean, unlike I've lived for months under the Palestinian Authority in places like Ramallah, no one cared if I was a Jew. They're not look, no one's running around hunting Jews anywhere and getting money from the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is there to arrest Palestinians and provide a pseudo government for Palestinians so Israel doesn't have to take on the responsibilities of occupation. He's just completely making that up out of whole cloth. And he doesn't seem to understand that Egypt gets that $2.5 billion or so from the U.S. as part of the Camp David deal so that it represses its own citizens who would like to resist Israel and would like to defend Palestinians from Israeli violence. Same with Jordan, which has a majority of Palestinian citizens. Those countries are paid by the U.S. to be repressive to their own citizens. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, I mean, he's just making that up. And it's, it's a slander of Palestinians to say that. Jewish civilians. So if you go to Israel and if you kill a Jew anywhere in the world and you're a Palestinian. Anywhere in the world. The Palestinian Authority will pay you money for that. And, and that's just a flat out lie, Max? It's a flat out, complete and total lie. Well, and I can't wait to, I can't wait to the, hear him answer that to you. What then? So, so he's saying U.S. taxpayer <clears throat> money is used to pay bounties to kill Jews anywhere in the world. I mean, that's just bonkers. Because Sorry. we fund, okay. Um, and they will. I'm not, I don't know enough to push back on this. Jesus uh, Christ. So uh, I know, I think most, there, there's, this, there's this narrative, and particularly on the liberal left, that says that Israel, that portrays Israel as a kind of occupying nation. So, I just, I can't, even to say kind of. <laughs> We we don't we don't. He's saying it's kind of. It's a hundred percent. What are you talking about? They don't, they don't have the freedom of movement. So that's the thing, right? So I, I wish I would have said this: that <laughs> the people who are in control of the situation, they have the greater moral responsibility. They the people who they're controlling don't. 
The people are in the the prison guards have a greater moral responsibility. The warden has a greater moral responsibility to take care of those people than those people do to at all. So that's the part I think he's totally missing because he keeps pretending that it's not an occupied state. It hundred percent is. And uh, every, you every know, it's just a left wing narrative. That that's not a left wing. That's every human rights organization in the world. It's the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242. I but, mean, it's, and he would say that's because they're anti-Semitic. Yeah. OK, so that's so this. Yeah. OK. On you know, a, a, a Palestinian land and it, the whole thing is alive from start to bottom. They, and let me just tell you a little bit about the history. The Israel the, and Joe. Okay, here we go. Well, it's a kind of an occupying nation sitting on a, a Palestinian land, and the whole thing is alive from start to bottom. And let me just tell you a little bit about the history. The Israel the, and Jordan were created, were part of the, what was called the British Mandate when the Ottoman Empire, in 1922, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed after World War I, we went to war. The Palestinians were on the side of the, of the Ottoman Empire against the Allies. The Jews were on our side. There were more Jews in uh, Palestine at that there time. There he goes again. Uh, Wait a minute. Stop. First of all, that's totally false that there were more Jews inside Palestine at that time than there were Arabs. Uh, that's why there was the Arab revolt, because the Peel Commission was giving uh, the Jewish population or allotting the Jewish population uh, ports and better land and more land while they were in the minority. It's why Israel couldn't accept Resolution 181 and had to initiate ethnic cleansing because the populations were so similar in the territory that was partitioned for a future Israel. And then it wouldn't have been a Jewish state and the Arab population could have, the Palestinian population could have potentially elected a Palestinian prime minister. So they had to forcibly eject, eject them. Then he completely leaves out the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was a straightforward colonial plan to give the, the uh, Palestine to the British mandate. This was in 1916. And he seems to be justifying the occupation on the basis that Palestinians fought on the wrong side in World War I, I on the side of the Ottomans, when they, were, they didn't have a choice to live under the Ottoman Empire or not. And who says that, you know, we're the good, we were the good guys in World War I. World War I was a disaster that led to the Versailles Agreement, which created uh, you know, humiliated Germany and gave rise to Hitler. So the whole history is completely jumbled here and convoluted. But the biggest uh, distortion is that there were there were more Jews than Arabs at that point, mm. and that they were given a raw deal when they were a settler colonial population that was infringing on the territory of the Palestinians who had been there for centuries and were being moved in under the auspices of a colonial mandate. We're Palestinians. But at the end, the, the Ottoman Empire disappears. And so there's a lot of land that is part of the Ottoman Empire. And the question is, what do you do with that land? Well, Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations said, what we're going to do is we're going to give it to whoever lives there. Oh, whoever lives on no, that it land. Was Sykes now, Pico. It was wasn't some international agreement. Say it again. It was Sykes Picot. I mean, these were, you know, these were colonial great game players, and it was like a secret agreement. There was nothing democratic about it. The Palestinians were completely shafted. Okay. Their own country. Well, they took Palestine, um, and they said, we're, there, there's half the people, a little over half are Jews, a little under half are Arabs. So we're going to cut it in two, and we're going to give half part of the, the Jews, part of the Arabs. But there was so much anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic bigotry at that time that they gave four-fifths of it to the Arabs and one-fifth to the Jews, just a tiny sliver nine miles across to the Jews, tiny, tiny little piece of land with their sacred sites that were not Muslim sacred sites ever. So, um, you know, that's how... how I mean, he's just, the, the, I don't even know where he's getting that from, but he's basically saying that a Jewish state, an exclusive Jewish state could have, should have been created out of a settler colonial population that was in the minority over the whole of Mandate Palestine after World War I. 
this is just next level. Okay. But let's move on. The original distribution. And then in the 48 war, um, the, you know, when Israel got its statehood, all the, they were immediately attacked by every, uh, you know, by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, all, all the surrounding um, countries and Lebanon and, um, and miraculously beat them off. The Palestinians were on the side of the attackers. All right, wait, stop here. Okay. The Palestinians were on the side of the attackers. The Palestinians were being ethnically cleansed. 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly removed from their homes, their towns, their even cities like Jaffa, uh, which has now been absorbed into the Tel Aviv municipality. The entire neighborhood of Manshia was destroyed in this process of ethnic cleansing that actually began in 1947. Over 200 Palestinian villages had already been destroyed when is by the time Israel signed its so-called Declaration of Independence in 1948. The Palestinians were fighting against their own dispossession with a pathetic army that was poorly armed. And these there was not some miraculous Israeli victory. It was kind of a phony war, and the victory was foretold. The Egyptian monarchy barely resisted. The Egyptian force consisted mainly of volunteers associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. There were not that many of them. The only real force capable of challenging the Israeli uh, military, the Haganah and the Zion or the Zionist uh, militias, which were heavily armed and were, you know, even getting um, submachine guns uh, through Czechoslovakia was the Jordanian Royal Legion, which had been trained by a British military officer, Pasha Glub, and they cut a secret agreement. King Abdullah, the Jordanian king, cut a secret agreement with David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist movement who became Israel's first prime minister, to have the Jordanian Royal Legion stop at the Latrun Gap around Jerusalem. They would get East Jerusalem, and then Israel would be allowed to be created as this Jewish state. And so they never actually defended the Palestinian population. And King Abdullah was later assassinated by a Palestinian for selling them out. Who, who's King Abdullah? He's from the Hashemites. They were kicked out of Iraq by the Iraqi people because they were a British colonial, they were imposed by the British colonial rulers. And then they were just given this little territory by the British. So, I mean, RFK doesn't know any of this history, but Israel's victory in 1948 wasn't miraculous. It was a titanic crime. Uh, the, the, there were Palestinians from uh, Lida Ramle were sent on a kind of trail of tears called a death march. It was like they called the Lida death march uh, after they were massacred under the watch of Yitzhak Rabin. And in his own uh, memoir, Rabin said that he was asked by Ben Gurion what to do. You know, ben Gurion asked him what to do with that population. He asked Ben Gurion what to do with the Palestinians there, and Ben Gurion went like this and waved his hand, get rid of them. Why did he wave his hand like that? He didn't want it put in print because the Nuremberg trials had just taken place, where Nazi war criminals were convicted of crimes against humanity, and he was worried that if he put it in print, this order to ethnically cleanse this population, he too would be convicted, possibly, of crimes against humanity. So he leaves out this entire <clears throat> history that defines Palestine. It's why there are over 5 million Palestinian refugees and millions more living in the Palestinian diaspora. He denies that history. And to me, that's the moral equivalent of Holocaust revisionism. Okay. In all of those countries, all the Jews were expelled. So all of those countries expelled every Jew in the country and took away uh, something like 27 million square miles of land that were just taken away from them. And those Jews were all sent to Israel. Israel did not were, do that to the Jew, to the Palestinians. Wait a minute, stop. While that is, it is true that Jews were expelled or made to feel uncomfortable in Arab countries after the state of Israel because Israel then, the Z because Zionism cast them 
as potential Zionist collaborators, the Zionist underground in mm. Baghdad actually planted bombs in Jewish community centers. And this is uh, detailed in books like The uh, Gun and the Olive Branch. Uh, this is established history in order to compel Jews to leave those countries because Israel would benefit from having more Jews in this demographic trench war that they're waging against Palestinians. Similarly, in Egypt, you have the Levan affair, named for the then Israeli defense minister under David Ben-Gurion, Pinchas Levan, where uh, Zionist spies or Israeli spies were recruited from within the Egyptian Jewish community to plant bombs in public places in a plot to blame the communists and the Muslim Brotherhood for creating instability in hopes that the British would then intervene and prevent Nasser from nationalizing the Suez Canal. This is well-established history. It's uh, Israeli historians like Abi Shlaim of, of, have uh, written extensively about this. It was Ben-Gurion who conceived this plot. So what did it do in the, Egypt, in the mind of the Egyptian population? It made all Jews in Egypt seem suspect and connected to Israel, and that population had to leave. So today, uh, there are like 20 Jews left in Egypt. So I see Zionism not just as this giant crime against Palestinians, but also against Arab Jews and against Jews around the world, because we, we are not necessarily Zionists, but anti-Semites, if they want to implicate us or attack us, can it try to implicate us in Israel's crimes. And that's kind of what uh, Bobby Kennedy's unfortunately doing here in pushing back against uh, manufactured allegations of anti-Semitism against himself. He's trying to emphasize his support for Israel as if Jews and Israel are necessarily connected or that we're all represented by this self-proclaimed occupying Jewish state thousands of miles away. I hope you understand what I'm saying yes. there. Sorry for going so far down the rabbit hole. I'll try to no, no. it quick. Okay. In Israel, it allowed them to stay. And then, you know, it's been attacked. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry, sorry. I got to correct him there. He said that they allowed the Palestinians to stay in 1948. That's I mean, we just covered that. That is just denial of one of the most massive acts of ethnic cleansing in 20th century history. Okay, let's move okay. on. Attacked in 67. Okay, and stop. The, uh, he said that Israel was attacked in 1967. That's another falsehood. Israel attacked first. Nobody denies that. Even Michael Oren, the uh, Israeli historian who wrote a propagandistic pro-Israel chronicle of 1967, acknowledges that Israel attacked first in 1967 in order to wipe out the Egyptian air force. Uh, Israel was also seeking to provoke that war in the Golan against Syria through various means, but it's just false to say they they were attacked. Okay. It, it won, but why, in that land, it was attacked, and it took land from its attackers. The Palestinians, again, were on the losing side. But it took... Oh, you're on the losing side, land. so you deserve to be occupied. <laughs> that, so how about the Native Americans? I mean, the Kennedy family has been uh, that is, advocates for Native American sovereignty in I the know. U.S., so did they deserve it? from the attackers, which is the West Bank, Gaza, Sinai, and the Golan Heights. And then Israel said, look, we want to give it all back. But we're not going to give it back because you can attack us from those parts. We're not going to give it back unless you promise us peace. If you renounce violence and us, if you admit that we have a right to exist, we'll give it back. Egypt said yes. And Syria got the Golan Heights and Sinai, and they got it back. Jordan stop, 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 stop. That is, I can't even believe what he just said. He said Syria got the Golan Heights. That's what he that said. That would be news to Syria, yeah, right? Yeah. Israel. That would even be news to Donald Trump, who had an illegal settlement built in the occupied Golan Heights named after him, Trump Heights. The Golan Heights is still occupied by Israel. They never got the Golan Heights back. And the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt liberated its own territory where Israel was building settlements. 
through military force in the 1973 war through a surprise attack. So it wasn't through uh, renouncing violence that they got it back. It was through military force that the Camp David Accords came about in 1977. That's that's how Israel operates. So he's just just completely making stuff up here. I, I I can't even believe that he thinks that the Golan Heights was returned to Syria. Okay, even I knew that wasn't true. I don't know why it slipped past me. Because there's so much he's coming at you. So fast. That's what I said. There was just such an avalanche of stuff. I did not expect that. You know, I thought we'd talk about, hey, Gaza's an open air prison, an apartheid state, right? What do you say to that? And he's going back to the Ottoman Empire and reliving the war. I'm like, oh my god, I didn't pay attention in school. And uh, so here we go. Oh, you know, the, the, um, and and today. You have, you know, the Palestinian Authority, and in Gaza, if you kill a Jew, you get a street named after you. The children are, are taught from kindergarten that killing Jews is a, an act of patriotism. That, that's, that's just the, slander. Uh, I mean, that's slander. He has no basis for saying that. Meanwhile, in Israeli kindergartens, they are presented with, uh, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're dressed in military uniforms. They're encouraged to start preparing for the military, that they all have to join at age 18. So, all right. Wow. Yeah. Can I, can I say something really yes, quick? Yes, please do. I, I just, I hope Again, that... Again, this, this, yeah. this isn't... We're not trying to take down Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. What we're trying to do is, is get him to stop saying this shit. That's what, I, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm trying to get him to stop saying this stuff. I don't know what his political calculation is to say this, but there's obviously one. But you can't win. I, I maybe you can win this way. Maybe he, I. I don't. I'm not a. Well, unfortunately, most American voters just don't care about foreign policy, let alone Israel Palestine. So he understands that you know. Yeah. And maybe he is doing it because of the Jeremy uh, Corbyn thing, where they see the Jeremy Corbyn thing is one too, but also as well like his coverage. He knows that if he goes against you know uh the israeli lobby they can hurt him you know with the uh, getting news coverage and whatnot right and not the fact that he's already kind of blackballed anyways but still maybe he thinks that that could be it down the road but if he's watching today i hope he does take this because you know as well as i do there's no way there's no way whatsoever that his communications director there's no way that dennis kucinich there's no way whatsoever they're going to be like you can take this interview They'll be like, do not take this interview. Do not do it. No way. But if he does take it, it's going to show that he has some pull on what he can do within his own campaign and that he's his own man. That's the thing that's going to really make him look good because he said he would do it. There's no way that his communication directors will want him to go near Max yeah, Bruno Okay. Whatsoever. So okay. if he does take that interview, he's going to look like he's making his own choices, you know. And you got to take your lumps. Yeah. You got, you got this is part of it. You got to take your lumps. Just take them and move out your campaign. But uh, did you? All right, I'm going to play something else, Max. Eighty-five percent of those countries, people in those countries, when polled, believe that it's okay to kill civilian Jews, and that it's okay, and that uh, Israel has no right to exist, and their purpose is to destroy Israel and to exterminate the Jewish people. Now, Israel. Well, where did he get that poll from? I don't know. Eighty-five percent believe it's okay to kill Jews, and he constantly conflates all the world's Jews with Israelis, with with Israelis, which is what I'm not saying. He's an anti-Semite. I'm just calling out this flawed logic, which conflates Jews with Israelis, because anti-Semites do that in order to hold all Jews responsible for Israel's crimes. So it's very dangerous rhetoric that I don't think he understands. I don't think he understands the danger of it. Only but, uh, deliberately but presenting, no. presenting everyone around Israel as just a genocidal terrorist, and he wants to be the peace candidate. So I guess there's no hope for for any peace negotiations. He's just writing off negotiations there, and he's signing on to Israel's policy of permanent war with the entire region. Very targets. So oh, civilians do get killed, but for example, in Janine, you know, in the in the uh, in the recent battle over Janine, Janine. Is a is a bomb factory. It's you know it's it's terrorist bomb factory. But Israel, unlike Russia, which when they you know have areas like that in Chechnya or the United States and Iraq, Wait, stop for a second. We bomb the whole. 
he keeps mispronouncing Chechnya like he's never heard. I of know it. it was it was weird that he didn't he mispronounced Chechnya. It, it's like how in his Shmuley event he referred to hijabs, which Muslim women wear commonly, including in the United States, where he should be seeking uh, their votes. He refers to them as habibs, which demonstrates like a complete lack of contact contact with Muslims or Arabs. Uh, and he, you know, okay, so here he refers to Janine as a bomb factory. I mean, I, this is sickening rhetoric that there are no people there. Anything Israel wants to do to this city filled with people, including thousands and thousands of refugees who've been dispossessed, who live in just miserable poverty that he can't even imagine, that they just all, whatever happens to them, they deserve because they're not civilians. And then I don't even think that Israel is alleging that Janine is a bomb factory. The problem that Israel has with Janine is that the Palestinian Authority, its occupation subcontractor, is unable to control the population there. They've started to form armed resistance militias, armed militias, which are attacking Israeli occupation soldiers as well as settlers. And they actually put up pretty strong resistance to Israeli military incursions. Um, so you have an occupied, occupied population resisting its occupier with arms. That's why Israel went in with 2,000 soldiers. And then he proceeds to tell more falsehoods from here. Because, right. you know, we're not going to send troops in there who are going to die protecting so people. You're saying Israel does. I know I've covered stories where they bombed schools. Well, but oh, not what are you never, talking about? never, never deliberately. Oh yes, oh, in war. <laughs> so I don't know what else I could say to yeah. that. He, I don't know what else I could say. I've covered stories where they deliberately bombed schools. I know this. I've covered it. And he just says no, not on purpose. And then he's going to say war happens, right? Bad things happen. Listen, yes, war, that's not true. Yeah, it is. Israel, of course, the it's IDF, true. Listen, the IDF. You know, Colonel Camp was one of the, uh, the, the top military experts in the world. I, I've covered these said, stories. Well, I, I understand. I, and, and Like, I don't know what else I was supposed to say to him. I don't know. I've covered this story. You're just, that's just not true. Yeah. I don't know what, am I supposed to scream at him? I don't know what I'm supposed to say, yeah. but that's just not true. Yeah. Uh, it's collateral fact. damage, Jimmy. They don't yeah, want to do it. I it know. just happens because they're, you know, military's hiding out in these schools. And what are you going to do? It's collateral damage. You can't bomb a goddamn prison. Which is what they keep doing. Okay. Maybe somebody, I, I'm saying it's a policy. Of course, in war, stuff happens. And you may. Have so that's what he's saying. They bomb happens. schools because it's war and stuff happens. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> so, because I, and I know this because I've covered these goddamn stories. And so I, it when just. Janine, it, they, yeah, you showed them. They like. They destroyed a hospital there. They ran bulldozers through the center of town. They ran tanks through the refugee camp. This is the – Why are there refugee the, camps in the first effing place? Tell me – I should have said that. Yeah. Why are there refugee camps in the first place? What is that? Why are there refugee camps? Well, he said they let the Palestinians stay. So yeah. that means there, there, there is no reason for there to be refugees. But, uh, you know, and then he says they didn't kill any civilians. Hundreds of people were wounded. Thousands had to evacuate. and. While there were people killed by Israel who belonged to these armed militias, which aren't allowed to resist their occupation, according to him, because there's no occupation. They just like to kill Jews. They're just doing it because they just want to run around and kill, kill Jews. Jews everywhere. Yeah. Uh, there were also there was also at least one boy who was unarmed who was killed. Uh, but you know, who why even bother nickel and diming this stuff? The real issue is that. Robert F. Kennedy denies that Palestinians are occupied, and the only reason they do anything violent is that they're just anti-Semitic Nazis. So he's calling an entire population anti-Semitic. Uh, it's it's like nothing happened to them. Why are they so mad? Why are they? <laughs> okay. For some reason, though, uh, you know, I I I don't want to even continue debunking all this. It's okay. Like it's it, all right. I just want to say a few more things, and that that's all I have to okay. say. Okay. Because it's like, we, where, where are we even at here? Like eight minutes or something? I know, it's too, it's too much. I, that's what I'm saying. There was such a wall coming at me. Like, holy cow. Go ahead. Well, it's all propaganda. That, that was all propaganda. It was like 15-year-old talking point propaganda stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. He, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says that he's embracing his family's uh, legacy here on 
to Israel. First of all, Teddy Kennedy was wrong back when he ran against Jimmy Carter in 79. He, he supported Israeli settlement activity and supported everything that the Likudnik government of Menachem Begin wanted to do then in order to raise pro-Israel money. And Teddy Kennedy was heavily supported by AIPAC. He was one of AIPAC's favorite Democrats. So there's no, I don't see what there is to be proud of there. I think there, there's a lot to be proud of that Teddy Kennedy did. His convention speech was a great speech against inequality. His op opposition to Bush's war in Iraq, the speech he gave in the Senate on America's gulags, like Abu Ghraib, was incredibly heroic. His stance on Israel is not something to be proud of. And I was, I felt like it was tragic watching uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. seated with a Cretan, across from a Cretan like Shmuley Botiak, this race hustling former reality show fake rabbi, as he used the official version of his father's assassination by Sirhan Sirhan to implicate all Palestinians when I know Robert F. Kennedy Jr. doesn't believe the official version that some mad Palestinian just shot his father because he signed a weapons deal or supported a weapons deal for Israel. He doesn't believe that. He's passionate about opposing the official version of that. So why would you let this clown just get up there and spout a version of history that's so personal to you that isn't even true? I have questions about that. And I mean, then we have JFK's own pro problems with Israel, warning about Israel getting a nuclear program, for example, calling mm -hmm. for Jerusalem to be an international city. Uh, JFK was not the staunch ultra Zionist. He's not. He was not. He was not anything like today's uh, democratic politicians. And then finally, the Ken one of the proudest legacies of the Kennedy family is supporting the civil rights movement. And one of the things that was always at the center of their messaging, whether it was JFK, or RFK Sr., was that justice delayed is justice denied, and when justice is denied. That's when violence enters. And that if black Americans were going to be denied their civil rights and their basic rights, they would have nowhere to turn than to more radical leadership that was urging violence, um, urging the organization of kind of like armed self-defense militias against racist white cops. They always understood that. So why are Palestinians different when they've been denied not only civil rights, but the most basic human rights that anyone could possibly have to even own land? They're denied every possible right. They're denied the right to have rights. So why wouldn't they turn to violence? So I, I really want to question where Robert Kennedy Jr is embracing his family's legacy here. Is it the wrong part of that legacy or the right <laughs> part? Because I think there's a right part that he can embrace that will allow him to unite Americans, including Arab Americans, Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, but the growing base of Americans who understand that what Israel's doing is wrong, and to give Palestinians hope that someone is cutting against the consensus of the beltway duopoly, the uniparty on this issue, that someone isn't in the tank for APAC or the Adelson family. And so I don't know if he still has that opportunity here. He's gone really far down the rabbit hole. I fear that he might have fallen into a rat's nest with Shmuley and Morton Klein, but it's never too late to get out of there. If you were wrong well, about Russiagate yeah. and you're willing to admit it, then just step right. back Talk to some Palestinians. Go see the wall. Do you know? Do what you 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 know a version of uh, RFK Senior's poverty tour in Appalachia, the RFK Junior apartheid tour in Israel Palestine, and talk to Israeli dissidents, just like you talk to American dissidents on COVID and other issues. Talk to Israeli Jewish dissidents who have gone to jail rather than go into an occupation army. I know some young people in Israel who have gone to jail over five times rather than participate in that army. Talk to them. Okay, so we'll leave it there. That was great job, Max. Thanks for doing that. 
Thanks for coming on and pushing Thank back you, against that. I mean, and I look forward to your interview with him because now apparently he's agreed to do an interview with you. So that's fantastic. And I, I, I didn't I didn't want to um, mischaracterize it as a debate, but an interview, you guys are going to be debating Israel. That, that's what's going to be happening and the history of it. And so, but I th think it's great that there'll be an interview and you should be allowed to interview him, especially since he publicly called out your reporting and impugned it publicly. And the least you could do is then take an interview with that guy who's reporting you impugned, just like Peter Hotez uh, did to him. And so that would be a, a catastrophic miscalculation if he ducked the interview with you. And I think that's why he's agreed to do it, because he realizes that. And this is going to be a tough issue for him. I have no idea why he goes so strong uh, mm -hmm. in denying reality about the uh, Palestinian plight. Uh, maybe it's because he fears what they did to Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, that's a, certainly a legit fear. And uh, so maybe he runs, you know, a, a fantasy was, oh, maybe he's running uh, so strongly on the side of Israel. So, you know, it's like Nixon going to China, you know, like, so he's the guy he could go do, get it done then because he's not seen as an enemy of Israel. But that's just a pipe dream. But anyway, he's not going to get out of the, the primary. So that's, I said, so people ask me about that. Like, why didn't you bring that up? I brought it up. We, we, this is our third interview with RFK Jr. And the last time I brought it up to him and I said, uh, what are you doing? You know, you're running inside a party that has super delegates. So there, so <clears throat> there's no, you'd be better off running as a Republican. And he's like, no, he's a Democrat. And that's the, de it's his party. And he even made the case that the Democratic Party was a little better than the Republican Party, which is not, a, that's a very tough case to make because uh, they're the, they're not the lesser of two evils, as we've explained here on the show many times that the Democrats can do stuff that Republicans can't do. Like they wouldn't have let John McCain take us from two wars to seven, kick the kick 5.1 million families out of their house while they made sure the bankers kept their bonuses. But they would let the first black president do that. So that, that so th again, they wouldn't let they wouldn't let Herbert Walker, George Herbert yeah. Walker Bush pass NAFTA. While he gutted welfare, exploded the prison population and deregulated Wall Street and the telecommunications. But they would let Bill Clinton do it. But they wouldn't have let it would have been a hell of a lot. of They didn't. They already didn't let. It. So this idea that the Democrats are the lesser of two evil is false. It's a false idea. They're the greater evil. Uh, Glenn Ford used to say that all the time at the Black Agenda Report. And uh, I've heard I've heard Cornell West say that. Um, so let me check that. I've heard Cornell West say that Barack Obama was the Santa Claus of Wall Street. I don't think he said that they're great. So I'll check that. But, um, anything you'd like to say, Max, before we let you go? Well, yeah, I'm not going to hold out any more hope, uh, for an interview or dialogue. If one happens, it will, I'll try to keep it civil and Ken, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. will get equal time. He'll get to say his piece. We're not going to jump down his throat. Uh, can find an appropriate venue for it, but I'm not holding out any hope after all of what's happened. They know where to reach me. Um, but I just want to thank you, Jimmy. I mean, you had access to a candidate that you sympathized with on COVID and Ukraine, and you used the access to uh, drive home a principle that's important to us and to your audience. So you put principle above political access. And I think in doing so, you've opened up some space on the debate around Israel Palestine that wasn't there before, just a little bit more space. So I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, you're, you're welcome. My pleasure. And I appreciate you coming on and setting the record straight. And uh, uh, it's such a tragedy uh, that he, a guy who could stand up to the big pharma, military industrial complex, the intelligence community, and his own party. Uh, for some reason, can't find the words to do it around Israel, Palestine. It's a fatal flaw. It's, you know, great men have great flaws. I think RFK Jr. is a great man for a guy who can stand up for the environment like he did mm -hmm. and the way he stood up uh, uh, for vaccine safety and all the slings and arrows he's taken over that and COVID. Uh, you know, those, those are great acts. Uh, and now this is just as <laughs> horrible as those are great. Uh, the stance on and, and, and horrible and horrible in a sort of in such a traditionally horrible American political mainstream way. Yes, it, it's not like weird horrible like right, you know, right. It's, like it's not even like entertaining horrible. It's just 
typical horrible. Yes. And so I always... I said, you know, I, I anyway, I sympathize with anybody who has to run and get gets, gets called an anti semite when they're obviously not. Uh, and I sympathize with anybody who has to negotiate this issue. Somebody asked me, "Hey, Max," because someone asked me, I was out with a couple of Jewish friends talking about this in my interview with RFK Jr. And my Jewish friends said, well, "What's your solution?" And I go, "I don't have a fucking, I don't know. What do you, again? This isn't my issue. I don't know, Max. So, what is your solution to the Israel Palestine problem?" Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not I'm not really uh, into solutions when I have no power over well, well any, let's pretend you do any 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 law but any any I have no ability to make laws I know I'm but not what, running for office okay but, but if you had to write what it we could start with as a basis for a solution is something that I think Robert Kennedy jr would want for everyone in the United States under the US Constitution, which is everyone enjoys equal rights under the law. And currently Palestinians from the river to the sea do not enjoy that. And those living under occupation in Gaza and the West Bank have no rights. They literally have no rights. So this is about rights. It's not necessarily as much about land as it is about rights. And if they can't have rights what must they do to get them if no u.s president will allow them to negotiate for that because there's never been a peace plan put forward that was going to give those palestinians the rights that they seek um, so i believe the negotiation should be over the end of apartheid you have an apartheid system that exists from the river to the sea that provide that that provides superior rights to people on an ethno-religious basis. If they were born Jewish, they necessarily have superior rights to Palestinians. Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, why are they there? Most of them are refugees. Most of them. Like the overwhelming majority of them are refugees. And they can't leave and go into what is now Israel because they're not Jewish, simply because Israel needs to maintain a demographic majority of Jews in order to define itself as a Jewish state. If they allow them to go in and be free-range people, get out of their open-air prison, they are going to have children, and they're going to be there, and they are not Jewish. So you have a state that is an ethno-supremacist entity that denies rights to people who are of the wrong ethno-religious background. It's that simple. So, so I'm just talking about how do we get to the solution? We need to start talking about the issue of rights. And that seems like something that should be in Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s wheelhouse, but he's not thinking about that at all. Based on his comments, he's thinking about Palestinians as just like these genocidal anti-Semites who love to kill Jews for the sake of killing Jews. Um. That's that's not an uh, that's not hyperbole. That's exactly it is how he sounded. <laughs> that's exactly which was right. It's, it mm. is so beyond the pale. It it's just it's stunning to me, right? And mm. it's especially for a guy, again, who's showed so much courage on other things. It's just a head. Why down. why can I why can I as a, a American Jew have total unfettered access to Israel? become a citizen, get benefits from the state, while a Palestinian refugee whose grandfather is from Jerusalem cannot return, cannot go there, and will be shot if they attempt to try, as hundreds and hundreds of Palestinians were shot during the March of Return when they tried just simply tried to walk into Israel. Why is that? It's unfair. And by the way, the New York Times office in Jerusalem is a former Palestinian home of an ethnically cleansed Palestinian family named the Carmi family. Uh, Thomas Friedman purchased it in the 1980s, in 1986, I believe, when he was correspondent. And Gada Carmi, she's a very prominent Palestinian activist in London. Her father lived in that house. He was a the broadcaster for BBC Arabic. She's not allowed to go back to her home that the New York Times uses as an office to spout bogus misinformation about what's happening on the ground. I mean, just think about that. So that's where we, that's where, that's what we need to look. We need to look at 
through that lens, we need to look at the situation through the lens of rights to get to a solution. And that's how it needs to be explained to people on the other side too, especially who, those who are liberals in the U.S. who believe in things like civil rights and you know social justice. Yeah. And so the idea of what you touched on it, the idea of a one state solution won't work because you're saying that the Israeli government is afraid that the if they have a one state solution, then the Palestinians will outnumber the Jewish people and they can't have that. So that's why a one state well, yeah. solution that will never work. Right. I mean, you have a one state reality right now where Israel controls all Palestinians through different mechanisms. For example, it controls them in Gaza by keeping them in a cage and bombing them whenever they get too feisty. It controls them in the West Bank through the pseudo government of the Palestinian Authority, uh, which is a sort of a subcontractor of the occupation. And then it controls them in other areas of the West Bank just through raw military power. And it controls them inside Israel through this kind of um, two tiered system of citizenship. And then it keeps all the Palestinian refugees out. But if it were to embrace a one state in which everyone had equal rights and could go vote for a new prime minister, it probably wouldn't be someone like Benjamin Netanyahu who'd be elected. It would probably be a Palestinian prime minister. Uh, and that would be the end of the so called Jewish state. And and so that's why that'll never happen. Yeah. So so the that's only right. solution is a two state solution. Well, I a two state solution is a disaster as well. I mean, we're seeing the the fruits of a two state solution plan, which is you know what you see in the West Bank currently. Israel will never allow a real Palestinian state to exist. They've they've said that Yitzhak Rabin in his last speech before he was assassinated said he wanted to create something that was less than a state like a state, but less than a state. Um, because wh a real state would have a vote at the UN. Uh, uh, a real state yeah. would have a military. A real state would be able to control its own borders. Israel has never defined where its borders are, and it would have to do so. Um, and in a real state would uh, have political power that they can't allow. So that's why Israel has violated every aspect of the Oslo Accords while shaping the Oslo Accords so that it never had to negotiate borders or a real state. This is the situation they want, a perpetual one state reality of apartheid. That's what it is. Yeah. And we don't know where it starts or where it ends. Okay. Well, good luck on nailing down that interview with RFK Jr. <laughs> he has uh, said he has uh, agreed to be interviewed by you. That's what he told me. Uh, whether that means tomorrow or whether that means in 10 months, I don't know. But if it means tomorrow or next week, that's real. But if it means 10 months from now, that's not. That's so, not real. So for so fingers crossed. And I'm, exa I'm exhausted. Anyway, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm also exhausted. It, it, I was exhausted on Monday. I'm even more exhausted today. But yeah. uh, Monday was especially yeah, let's, well, let's get back to talking about vaccines and autism and the easy stuff, you know? I, right? The easy stuff. <laughs> right. Can we just talk about, you know, COVID and bioweapons and just <laughs> stop with this controversial, exhausting stuff about Jews and Arabs? And Softballs like gain of function. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. right. Softballs about natural immunity, herd immunity, yeah. contraction. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, Max, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank uh, you, Jimmy. Come see our live shows. We're going to be in Chicago, Rosemont, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, New York City, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, Stamford, Toronto, Toledo, Detroit, St. Louis, and more. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for those tickets. Mm -hmm.